Sex and Algebra 2, Lesson 1, Greetings Students. Welcome to a new year. Welcome to a fresh notebook. We're going to start with Lesson 1 today. Or no, I'm sorry, this is wrong. It's Lesson A. For reasons I cannot explain, John does a weird thing at the beginning of this book, the red book, that he doesn't do in any of the others. He has these lettered lessons before he kicks into the numbers. I don't know why, he doesn't do that anywhere else. But in any case, he does, and here's the way I'm gonna handle it. Lesson A and Lesson B are pretty crazy. They're wild, they have a lot of parts, um, and there's a lot of detail to go through. So, I slow down the pace here, and I'm gonna give you two days to absorb lesson one, two class days, if you will and then two days to absorb lesson B. So we're not covering four lessons this week, just two. You'll do the same amount of homework because I want you to do all the problems for lesson A and all the problems for lesson B. Not just odds or evens, but all of them, all 30 problems. So you get two days for each of those to do that. So you'll still be doing 15 problems, 15 problems, 15 problems, 15 problems. Um, I'm just giving you uh, the full week to get them done instead of squishing them. So today for Monday, the first drop day of your new math year, there's just one lesson, just lesson eight. If you want, you can divide it into two pieces, watch half of it and then do some problems. But honestly, that might be harder than it would be just to watch the whole thing and then be done and start in on your homework for lesson A. So, these lessons are challenging, but I'm giving you more time to do them. Remember that the way this sheet works is that these are the assigned lessons and this date is not when you start working them, but when you need to be finished with them. So today, this lesson is dropping on September 13th. You don't have any homework due today. I'm not that kind of a teacher. But next week, a week from today, I expect you to be done with these lessons. 30 problems from lesson A, 30 from B. Okay, so this is the date that your work is due. It's a Monday. You can space out your work however you like, just like before. Just make sure you get the assigned lessons done before the due date. This is where your parents signs to say, yep, I've looked this over and it looks really good. Remember, they're not correcting your math. You're doing that, right? You're working a problem, checking the answer. Working a problem, checking the answer. Make sure you have your solutions guide at the ready. Um, if your parent needs a quick refresher, you can remind them that this is what they're doing when they review your homework. Specifically, these are the steps right there. Okay, so this page, this reminds you of what you need to do. This is what they need to do, and then this is what I do. So I'll be talking more about this as we go. I'm not gonna cover that in a lot of detail today. Um, they sign off. You and I have a weekly video chat in which I'm going to ask to see that signature. Please do everything in your power to keep up to date with that. Midterms and breaks are on here. It works exactly like last year. And just like last year, we'll be done by the last week of May. A little bit earlier this year, I think. Um... We'll talk more about the midterms and the final when we get to them, but it's just like last year. Everything's the same. This is general information that you probably already know, but I'm gonna quickly review this for you today. Class meets online during the pandemic. If you're vaccinated, you can work directly with me um, and I'll feel comfortable that I'm not putting you at risk. I don't wanna meet with students that are unvaccinated because I don't wanna put them in any danger of possibly picking up something from me. I recognize that even though I'm vaccinated, I could still be breathing out those germs, introducing them in my household, and I don't wanna make any of my students sick. That would be a big fat bummer for me. So to protect my students, I'm meeting with them online unless they're vaccinated. New, student, new lessons are posted Mondays and Wednesdays. Last year, I posted all the lessons for the whole book, for all the books, so they're already online. So if you ever wanted to say work ahead, you can dig out 
last year's lessons and look at those. If I get sick or break my leg or I don't know, something crazy happens, I will definitely use my library of old lessons to keep you guys moving, but I am planning to record new lessons this year just to keep me engaged in what's happening. Um, I'm going to change the way I label this year's lessons. You know, I always write like Saxon Algebra 2 Lesson A. It would be this one. Last time I did it with the regular uppercase at the beginning of the word and then lowercase letters. This year I'm going to use all uppercase so you can tell this year's posts from last year's posts just by looking at them. You'd be able to tell by the post date as well, um, the date published. But I'm going to make it easy for you and use all capitals this year so you'll know that's current material. I'll send you the links Monday mornings and Wednesday mornings. Weekly assignments are due on Mondays as noted below. Yes, we talked about this. Parents are responsible for supervising and reviewing their students' progress. Make sure your parent looks over your work each week and signs off on this form. Students who successfully complete this coursework are eligible for an algebra, geometry, pre-calculus, or integrated math credit. See me if you'd like support in documenting this work. That's mostly for the parents. I think most of your moms handle this part of your homeschooling work. Um, but I can help with the credit getting business if need be. Students whose performance falls below 80% may be asked to complete additional assignments. This most of the time refers to test scores. If you score less than 80% on a midterm or the final, then we're going to chat about that and find a way to fix your grade. Call or message me anytime with questions or concerns. Phone number, email. Um, you, I may have told you guys, you may have gathered, I have a situation called delayed sleep phase syndrome. What that means is that I sleep very normally, but at different times than most people choose to. I have, it's, it's called a delayed shift, right? So my sleep sh has shifts. My biological need to sleep is much later than most other people's. So I stay up much later at night and then I sleep in the mornings. Um, I don't just play video games and eat Cheetos while I'm up late. That's when I like get things done that other people do. Usually like what people do in the morning, I do the night before. And then I sleep usually till about like 11 o'clock to get my seven hours in. So what that means is if you're thinking of texting me at nine o'clock and you're like, I don't know, it might be too late. No, trust me. It's not too late. I'm up every night until three at the least. So feel free to text me in the evenings. And conversely, if you send me a text at nine o'clock in the morning, you're probably not gonna hear back from for me for a couple hours. So just know that um, you're welcome to text me anytime. You're not gonna disturb my sleep cycle. A lot of people think that, that what I have is kind of like insomnia and it's hard for me to sleep. No, that's not it at all. I sleep very soundly. Um, I get a lot of questions like, how do you make your room dark? Like, do you wear eye masks? Do you have like really good blackout curtains? And I just laugh because I prefer to sleep in the broad daylight. I don't, I sleep with my windows wide open. I have a very bright room. It doesn't bother me in the least. In fact, I kind of prefer to sleep when it's bright outside. I don't know why. It's just a weird biological thing about me. My ancestors were like the um, night watchmen that sat at the mouth of the cave and kept out the cyber-toothed tigers while all the other people slept in the back. So, seriously, that's what my sleep doctor said, is that it, it, it's a genetic trait that was passed on. So, here I am, your nighttime math teacher, so don't worry about reaching out to me. Just go ahead and text me whenever you have a question or, you know, do whatever you need to do, and then I'll get back to you when I can. Okay, that's this. I'm setting this aside. Um, I will point out that once we get through this weird A and B lesson thing, everything else is exactly the same. The lessons are numbered just like you're used to. Okay, so let's talk about math, shall we? The first part of lesson A, part A, is what John calls a geometry review. One important thing to remember about the Saxon curriculum is that he blends the algebra with the geometry. So you don't have a separate geometry book. 
in Saxon, but he's blended into all the algebra. Okay, ready? You know what that is? That's called a point. It's a specific location and the dot in purest geometrical theory has, it's much tinier than that. It's like, you know, a tiny little electron or something, I don't even know. It's a tiny, tiny, tiny little location. And when we connect a whole bunch of them, we call that a line. Or we can call it a curve. I don't know if you can see that very well, but I'm just making a lot of dots. We would connect them together, right? Uh, when we have, draw a line, typically we draw it as if the points were all connected and filled in, right? That's a series of points. They go infinite in either direction. That is the way we usually draw a picture of a line. Um, we can divide a line up into a segment. If we don't want to talk about the whole thing, we just want to talk about part of it, we can put points we can identify certain points on the line. Usually we do that with letters. And we would identify that like this. We'd write segment AB. We could also use those letters to define the line. And we put a different little symbol up on top. Notice this is a segment. We don't put the dots on it, but we just draw a line without arrowheads. <coughs> Excuse me. We can put the arrowheads on and that means the line. There's also a thing called a ray. A ray is when you have an endpoint and then an arrowhead. That's a ray. So it's kind of like, you know, half a line. And we can define that. Let's put in our A and B again. And that's the way we would draw. We would write the symbol for a ray. Uh, okay. So those are a bunch of ideas related to the idea of a point. We also want to talk about the idea of a plane. A plane is a two-dimensional surface. A piece of paper is a beautifully, elegantly simple idea of a plane. It goes this way and it goes that way, but it doesn't go this way. Now a page has some thickness to it. A plane is one point thick. So it's f even skinnier than a piece of paper, but it is a two-dimensional surface. We usually draw it like that, right? To kind of try to show that. And we can have lines, we can have points, lines, curves, segments, rays that lie on the surface of the plane, okay? So we can have parallel lines, or we can have, I'm going to write the names of these in a second, we can have intersecting lines, intersecting. Oh, I forgot to say this, but remember, you're writing down whatever I write down. Part of that is to help put the ideas in your head. Part of it is to keep you from getting bored because I know I'm fascinating to listen to, but even that can get boring after a while. So by writing and keeping up with me in that respect, it just helps keep you busy. So your brain will listen and you won't fall asleep. Okay, so we could draw each of these on a plane, right? I'm gonna draw, rather than try and draw them slanty like that, Imagine that on like a flat piece of paper, okay? So our lines lay on a plane, lie on a plane. Okay, now, sometimes when we take intersecting lines, if we imagine three points like this, we can see how lines form angles. Huh, so that's our next little topic here is to think about all the different ways that 
two rays. This is a ray. This is a ray. But the whole idea is an angle. Huh, cool. There are many different kinds of angles. I think the classic one that everybody thinks of first is just something that looks like this. Um, we can draw arrowheads on these. I'll do that now, but in the future, we're not going to take the time to draw arrowheads. We're just going to know, oh yeah, these have arrowheads on them. Um, this is what we call an acute angle because it's less than 90 degrees. Let's remind, remember what an angle that is 90 degrees looks like. Oh yeah, it's straight up and down. And we put that little mark on there to remind ourselves that it's a perfectly squared off angle. And then we have the obtuse angle, right? which is bigger than 90 degrees. If I just kind of, this is to remind you where 90 degrees. So an acute angle is less than 90 degrees. A right angle is equal to 90 degrees and an obtuse angle is greater than 90 degrees. There's also a thing called a straight angle, which means it's this whole thing, which is kind of weird, right? And these, we're gonna talk about the, we're gonna talk more about the numbers in just a minute, but I'll just remind you that a straight angle is 180 degrees, because we can think of it as two right angles back to back, right? It's like two of those back to back. So if a right angle's 90, then two of them must be 180. Huh, okay. And then sometimes we'll do a thing where, like let's say we're looking at this angle, right? I'm just gonna put these in here to say that's the angle we're talking about. Sometimes we can say, no, let's talk about this part, the outside of the angle. And that has a special name, we call that the reflex angle. And it means the outside. of the other angle. All right, um, when we start to talk about the numbers, here's the easiest way to think of them. We can take a circle and divide it into four quadrants. We recognize that each one of these quadrants is a right angle. We can draw all these little symbols in there, right? Each one is a right angle. And so each one then is 90 degrees. That tells us that the number of degrees in the whole circle is 90 times four or 360. Okay, we can also take an angle and chop it up. So for example, here's a right angle and I'm gonna divide that into two smaller angles. I don't know how big each part is Let's just call this one A and this one B. We can say that A and B are complementary angles, okay? A and B are complementary angles. This is going to be important. We're gonna do some examples with this in just a second. Um, and then we can also do it with a, with a straight angle, which we know is 180, and let's just divide that into two angles. We'll call them C and D. And we can say that C and D are supplementary angles, which means together they add up to 180, together they add up to 90, okay? That's what that means. Um, how can you remember which one's complementary and which one's supplementary? Here's how I do it. This one's 90, this one's 180, right? So I think of them in order the 91st, the 182nd, because that's like the number order. And then these are alphabetical. C comes before S, 90 comes before 180. So that's how I keep it straight. Uh, looking at the book to see what else we need. One more piece. Vertical angles. 
Vertical angles are cool because they're so deceptively simple. <coughs> Excuse me. Two intersecting lines, right? Vertical angles are the pairs that are opposite each other. So every pair of intersecting lines has two pairs of vertical angles, right? These two are vertical, these two are vertical. Vertical angles are equal angles. I'm just gonna write it in layman's terms. Vertical angles are the same as each other, right? So that is a very helpful tool in some of these problems we're gonna cook up. Let's dive into some examples, shall we? Find X and Y. Now, these are fun because you get to draw the picture. And remember that my advice when you're doing the homework is, unless you can look at a problem and immediately know what you need to do, just draw the picture. It gives you time to think about it. It gives you time to notice the details. It allows you to kind of ease into the problem. What this line, I shouldn't, shouldn't be there. Ignore that. I've had parents tell their students, don't draw the picture, you're just wasting time. And I've had to explain to the parents, no, it's not a waste of time. It's an important part of understanding the problem. And when you drew this problem, I hoped what you noticed is, oh, up here, this is like one little box. That's actually a right angle, isn't it? So all of this, we know is gonna be 90 degrees, and we know that these two angles are complementary, aren't they? These two angles fill this box. We know this box is straight because that side tells us that this is 90 degrees. This is clearly a straight line, so that tells us that this side must also be 90 degrees. I'll just draw that box in there because I know that has to be true. That tells us this is 90 degrees. That tells us that X must be equal to 90, full range there, minus that 30 degrees. So that tells us that X must be a 60 degree angle. Guess what, that's right. Okay, now we pay attention to the bottom half and we see that these two must add to 180 because they are supplementary, right? Y and 40 go together Excuse me. to make a straight angle. So Y must be equal to the full 180 minus the 40. So that is 140 degrees. Yay! Those are the right answers. I'm on a roll, aren't I? We are on a roll. Yay, let's try A2. Find X, Y, and P. Okay, here comes another picture. That's a pair of intersecting lines. That gets me excited because I think, ooh, vertical angles. Okay, X degrees, Y degrees, 50 degrees, P degrees. And then John puts these little things in here. He doesn't like this. These are just little reminders to us that, oh look, it's vertical angles. But we have three letters and one number. So how are we gonna figure that out? My advice to you is pay attention to the number first. It usually helps to go alphabetical, but look at the number and work backwards from that. If this side is 50, then we know this side is 50 because vertical angles are always the same. So X has to equal 50 degrees. Now we're forced with, to deal with this. Now there's a couple ways we can look at it. One thing we can look at is to say, oh look, X and Y are supplementary angles, right? They add up to this straight line, so these must equal 180. So Y must be 180, the total, minus 50, which is X, 
which tells us it's 130 degrees. And then y and p are opposites. So P must also be 130 degrees. And that is the right answer. X equals 50. Yes. And if you saw other ways to figure it out that come to the same answer, that makes sense. Because there are lots of ways to look at the vertical angles and the supplements and make sense of this. All right? Now, the next one needs a little bit more figuring. So let me flip. Oh, I soaked through. Ready? Example A3. This one tells us to find x, y, and p again, and the picture looks similar. But when I go to write down the values, they look scary. And again, John puts markers like this just to help us remember, oh yeah, vertical angles. Now, what is going on here? This looks fine, that looks fine. This looks creepy and scary. What John is doing is he's combining algebra with geometry. And I'll show you how that works in a minute. But first let me say, the parentheses, don't let those scare you. What he's really saying is that this angle, it has a value of 5x. But it's 5x degrees, but he needs to put the degrees on the whole 5x term, so that's why he puts the parentheses around it. That might be, that might not make sense to you, that's okay, but just know that these parentheses aren't hurting anybody. They're just applying the degrees, the unit, to the whole term and not just the x or the five, okay? So it's saying the whole expression 5x, that's the measure of this angle. So don't let those degrees freak you out. Now, once again, my advice is find the number, find the solid number, and then work backwards from there. I know that 110 must equal 5x. That scares me a little bit, so this feels better to me. These two are supplements, right? P and 110 have to equal 180. So I know that P equals 180 minus 110. And that is 70 degrees. Beautiful. Now, look, let's look at vertical angles. And there's, again, there's multiple ways you can sort this out. I'm just doing what occurs to me. As long as your logic holds and you find the right answer, you can use other ideas. P equals 2y, right? Because they're vertical buddies. P is 70. So I can substitute that in. 70 equals 2y. And now I can divide by two and I can get y equals 35 degrees. No, y just equals 35. 35 is an algebraic value. It's not the measure of this angle because notice we have to multiply it by two to get the angle. So I don't wanna put degrees on that because that is not the measure of that angle. That's the value for y. So we're solving algebra inside of a geometry problem. And that's the fun of these to me. All right, now we can do the same thing. We can say, oh look, 5x has to be equal to 110. Right, because those are vertical angles. Divide both sides by five, and we get x equals what, 22, right? And again, this is not degrees, this is not the measure of the angle, it's an algebraic value that will lead to the measure of that angle. The measure of this angle is 110. The value for x is 22. Subtle, weird difference. We'll talk more about it as we go. Okay, the other part of this lesson, somehow we're up to C. I don't know what B was, but anyway, it doesn't really matter what we label them. We're gonna talk a little bit about absolute value. I hope you think absolute value is easy because it is. Mathematically, it's super easy. Sometimes it can be a little bit of a mind bender. So let me tell you again what it means. Here's a number line, here's zero. Over here is negative three, over here is positive three. 
If we want to find the absolute value, what we're measuring is the distance from the number that we've decided on, whatever we're talking about, from that number to zero. Okay? How far, what is the absolute value of three? I'm gonna write here. That's, how, that's what we're saying here. This distance is the absolute value of three. How far is it from zero to three? It's three units, right? So that's how we, that's how we uh, show that answer in symbolic form. Now, what if we're down here at negative three and we wanna know the absolute value of negative three? Again, we're asking how far is it from our number to zero? So that's this. My number line wasn't perfectly proportional, was it? How far is it from negative three to zero? Well, that's also three units. The fact that we're traveling on the other side of the zero in negative land, that doesn't matter. It's just the number of units. The distance from our number to zero is three. That's why absolute values look weird but make sense. We're measuring the distance from that number to zero. And that's why everything will be positive. Okay, so whatever is inside of an absolute value sign, sometimes we have to simplify it. One, two, three minus signs, that means it simplifies to that, right? And we bring it out as a positive. Absolute value signs we simplify and then bring out as the positive value. Here's a problem to remind you of what a drama these can be. Okay, so we're going to go through and simplify from left to right, and then we will do the subtracting and adding there. All right, so let's figure this thing out. Minus, minus four. Well, this is one of those minus signs hanging out on the outside. Usually we do it with parentheses, but we can also do it with absolute value lines. We cover it up. Now we simplify. Oh, and look, I already did this one, didn't I? I just picked four and it was the same. The distance between negative four and zero is four. Positive, absolute value turns everything positive. But this minus sign is outside of the absolute values, so it does not get erased in the absolute value simplification. That we have to put back on. Minus two plus, now what do we do with this? Okay, there's nothing to simplify inside. We just go, what's the distance from minus five to zero? Five units, right? So you can think of it with this definition, or you can just remember that absolute value lines are negative landmines. They blow up negative signs that are inside of them. Okay, so then this becomes what? This is negative six, and so this equals negative one. Yay, that's the right answer. Okay, almost done. Hang in there. Lesson D. Properties versus definitions. These are two words that the math gods throw around, um, properties and definitions, but they have a subtly different meaning. Okay, properties are the way something is. Okay, it's inherent, it's unchangeable. Okay, an example of that is three plus two equals five. As long as we agree that three represents that many things and two represents that many things, that's always gonna be true. That's just the way it is. This is a property and we can't change that. It just is what it is. A definition, however, is different. And a great way to talk about definitions. Definitions are what we've agreed upon. And by we, I mean the community of mathematicians. 
Okay, and one of the great examples of that is that this little two up there, that exponenty thing, that means three times three. This is a definition of how we use exponents. And that's just the way we've agreed to write this idea. Okay, it's not inherent that it has to be that way. That's just the way we do it. So exponents are definitions, and that's why it's important that we need to remember the rules that we've agreed upon for these concepts. Let me just show you, and then you'll be like, okay, now I know what she's talking about. Here's a problem. I'm writing it down. Copy it with me. Now, in order to know how to simplify this, we have to rely upon definitions, rules that we've agreed upon as to what this means. What we've agreed is that when parentheses are on the outside of a minus sign, that minus sign is protected. We can't cover it up. And this actually means minus two times minus two times minus two. The three tells us how many times to multiply it. The minus sign tells us that we must keep, or the parentheses rather, tells us that we must keep the minus sign bundled with the two. Make sense? There's no reason it has to be that way. It's just what we've agreed upon. So when we simplify this, we know that we're gonna get eight and then one, two, three minus signs. That's an odd number. So this is gonna simplify to minus eight, okay? Here, we know that the definition is different. When the minus sign is outside, or there aren't any parentheses, we can cover it up. Then we can calculate this. That's two times two, which is four. And then we put the minus sign back in, All right? Again, that's a definition we've agreed upon. Here, we've got the double whammy. I cover that one up. I let that one go along for the ride. This becomes positive four, but the minus nine still exists. And so, when we combine all of those, our final answer is minus 16. Beautiful, right? You wouldn't be able to do this problem unless you understood the definitions. The interesting thing about properties is that we really don't have to talk about those very much. We understand them intuitively. It's the definitions that give us trouble because we have to remember all the things that we've agreed upon. Okay, that is the end of lesson A. So let me show you what you've got. Again, you have two days to do all of these 30 problems. You may divide them up how you want. If you want to go 1 through 15, which would take you to there, and then do 16 through 30 the next day, that is fine with me. If you want to do odds, then evens. If you want to do evens, then odds. Any of those three options is just fine with me. You could start at 16, go to 30 the first day, and then the second day go 1 to 15, but I don't really recommend that. Um, John lays these out in this order for a reason. He uses different parts of your brain to do different kinds of problems. So I don't recommend that you do the second half and then the first half. But you can do the first half and the second half, or all the odds and then the evens, or the evens and then the odds. So I want you to do all 30 problems over two sessions. Please don't try to do all this in one session. That would probably hurt your head. And then when you've done all 30, you can cross off the whole box. I get to cross it off because I have taught it. I cross off when I teach. You cross off when you do the homework. I know, it's not fair. Okay, oh, I haven't done B yet. Oops! But by next Monday, your paper will look like that. Yay! Okay, we're off to the races. Lesson A is under our belts. Good luck. I'll see you next time for lesson B. Goodbye.